Hi, my name is Tina Irv. I'm a program director from the Division of Rare Disease Research and Innovation at the National Center for Advancing Translational Science at the NIH. I'm grateful. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm just sorry I'm unable to be here in person. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network and uh, rare diseases. So first of all, I'm going to ask you to imagine an illness that affects 30 million Americans. And that's as many people as there are in the US that have diabetes. It's more than have cancer, HIV, or Alzheimer's. And actually, it's more than have cancer, HIV, and Alzheimer's combined. I'm talking about rare diseases. There are 30 million people in the US with one of 7,000 rare diseases. That's one in 10 Americans. So if you know 10 people, you know one of them is going to have a rare disease. Half of the rare diseases of are impact the lives of children. Most rare diseases are serious, life-threatening, and 95% have no treatment or cure at this time. Just even getting a diagnosis as having a rare disease is an ordeal in and of itself. Doctors are often taught when they're learning and you see a disease and you're not quite sure what it is and you hear hoof prints, hoof beats, they say, think of horses, not zebras. So they're telling doctors who are learning that if you see something unusual, it's usually not something rare, it's usually something normal. And what rare disease patients are trying to do is get people to think more of the zebras and that it oftentimes is something unusual when doctors can't figure it out. So the National Organization of Rare Disorders, NORD, reports that about 1 in 13 people are currently living with an undiagnosed condition and it usually takes five years or longer for someone with a suspected rare disease to receive a correct diagnosis and oftentimes they see over seven doctors along the way. The diagnostic odyssey is real and it's prolonged and it can result in irreversible complications in the disease that happens during this diagnostic period. It is difficult to find rare disease patients within a healthcare system since oftentimes the majority of rare diseases lack specific codes. Incidence and prevalence of rates of, for many rare diseases is often just a guessing game. It's also very expensive. The cost, direct cost, uh, medical costs of rare diseases is very high. It's, it's estimated to be three to five times higher than for non-rare diseases. So what are some of the other pain points? Basically, currently, one of the biggest pain points is it takes 10 to 15 years to get a drug to market. It can cost two to $6 billion to develop a drug from initial discovery to completion and less than 12% of drugs get an approval rate when they enter the competitive. So basically we're slow, we're expensive, and we're oftentimes not ready for trials when we go to start a clinical trial. So what do we need to do? Basically we need to work faster, we need to do it in a more cost-effective way, and we need to have more high-quality data and research. So we also need to lessen the risk. Remember, only 5% of rare diseases have an FDA-approved treatment. How do we intend to do this? By being prepared. So the focus of the RDCRN, the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network that I work with, is to be prepared, and we do so with clinical trial readiness. And what do we mean by clinical trial readiness? It's to have a really good understanding of the disorder before you even get to a clinical trial. It's to understand the why. Why are we going to treat this disease? How are we going to treat it? What are we going to use to treat it? Where can we treat it? You know, where are the experts and where are the patients? Who should we treat with this specific drug and when should we treat them? And how should the trial be conducted? And that's all what we refer to as clinical trial readiness. 
So how can we be ready? How can we work faster? We can establish networks like FeeFree um, that works closely with patient advocacy groups. And we can develop natural history studies to under get a gain a better understanding of how the diseases go through time. We can identify biomarkers so we can be better targeted at a treatment. And we can identify common data elements so everyone studying a specific disease can be looking at it in the same way. And so data sets can be combined. So the RDCRN was established as part of the Rare Disease Act of 2002. And the language in the law directed the NIH to establish rare disease centers of excellence. By the end of the current cycle of the RDCRN, we will have had 33 different consortia studying a variety of rare diseases. And so these consortia started, the, the RDCRN started in 2003, is competed every five years, and is now in its fourth iteration. The RDCRN is a network of 20 different consortia that, support, that are supported by 10 different NIH institutes and centers that study rare disease. Each consortium in the network must study at least three different rare diseases and conduct pilot studies, support early career investigators, and conduct one study which is natural history or longitudinal in nature. The consortia are all cooperative agreements that work closely with the NIH. They also partner with patient advocacy groups. And at this time, across the network, there are over 166 patient advocacy groups working with us. The aims for the current consortia within the RDCRN is to target three areas the inclusion of patient advocacy group to the greatest extent possible. When we say that, when we're including patient advocacy groups, we don't mean just ask them to, say, to, to promise to find patients for the studies or to write a letter of support when they submit the grant, but it's really to be at the table working together with the clinicians and the research scientists to really gain a better understanding of the disease and to establish data standards across the network to facilitate data sharing, good data practices, and have data that's rigorous and reproducible, and most of all, transparent and shared. And again, I want to focus on clinical trial or emphasize clinical trial readiness of natural history studies, biomarkers, common data elements, and to use economies of scales and to innovate models for trials. Currently, the network, we have 358 active consortia sites, of which 197 are unique sites, meaning that oftentimes, say for example, UCSF, um, University of California, San Francisco, has eight or nine different sites, as does Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. The consortia also partner internationally, and 12 countries are represented within the RDCRN network. We're also trying to work in a way that's cost effective. And as I mentioned earlier, we believe in working using economies of scale. So really having shared work environment and shared tools and develop models for trials that, are, um, that can be looking at multiple diseases at a time or multiple treatments at the same time. So one of the things that the RDCRN is doing is building a cloud environment where researchers can work together in shared resources. So we have an operational environment where, um, for example, fee-free consortium has um, data resources that they can bring together. They have statistical packages. They have a box where they can share all the information together. So instead of each of the 20 consortia within the RDCRN um, buying these resources themselves, they're going to be sharing those resources. And then we will eventually have an environment where the data is going to be shared publicly and individuals can access that data. We also have strategies for 
fair principles of data, so the data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible, and good data practices, and rigorous science. And what we're really doing is ex working with the new NIH policies and procedures so individuals can work and share their data together. So I'd like to thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at urvtiin at mail.nih.gov. And have a great day. Thank you.